Does that, does that work? Hey, hey, hi, everybody. Boy, you know, uh, following Janet Porter is not a good place to be. <laughs> but when I was in the State House, I'm telling you, Janet Porter, she was a powerhouse. And you all, you, you would know that because when we go to talk to a committee chairman or a leadership and you mention her name, they get this very angry look on their face right away. <laughs> and that was because she was so consistent and so determined and uh, really such an inspiration to so many of us in the State House. So let's give her another round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. So uh, I'm Matt Lynch, in case somebody here doesn't know that. And, and as Mary mentioned, I am running for Congress against uh, Dave Joyce, Republican incumbent in the uh, primary coming up on March 14th. Seven counties, uh, including where we're sitting today. 15th, yes, what did I say? 14th, why is it 17th? I think it's that St. Patrick's Day. But it's the, it's the 15th uh, of March. And um, uh, I was in the State House, as Janet alluded to a couple of times, as many of you know, and found myself uh, frustrated by the Republican Party yeah, leadership part. and ultimately deciding uh, to run this day choice two years ago. Uh, and brought to uh, consideration, again, should I, should I take him on again? And uh, actually, as a result of a lot of encouragement from the pastor and a lot of people in this room, uh, of course, I've decided to do that. And yeah, so I, I prayerfully ask for you to uh, be involved in that campaign. You're going to matlinch.com and uh, really changing the tenor of things uh, that are going on in Washington. So with that, you know, we're here to talk about you know, all lives matter. And uh, several thoughts are in my head, so I'm just going to sort of speak and at some point I'll, I'll shut up. But, uh, you know, one of the things that struck me this last week when we saw what happened out in California was uh, something that we've seen so many times before, but it's always not simply inspiring, it's almost surprising. But when bad things happen, it's guys and gals in uniforms like this that run to the danger, right? Where everyone else is running away. There was a, there was a, when they had that shootout on the street, there was some company nearby, and they have their cell phones out, which everyone does today. And so they have some, this, this uh, very, uh, you know, this video that was shot off of someone's cell phone. And they're hearing these gunshots, and they're all saying, oh, shut the door, duck down, get away, as the, as the police were streaming down the road to the gunfight. And, you know, I'm not sure how many of us in this room could do that. I don't, I don't frankly think I could do that. Uh, and, and so we really have to recognize that when we talk about what lives matter, it is those lives on the front line that are protecting all of our lives. Uh, and and, and we, we cannot allow the politically correct class to decide that they're going to focus on one or two incidents that frankly often are, are, uh, are not even bad incidents, but it's blown up by the media. But focus on those and ignore the heroism that goes on every single day um, by our, our, our police and our firefighters and, and our military. And I, I, you know, I, I think about that shoot on the street. The first officers that realized that they might have these two suspects in, in the chase, they were not even SWAT team members. They weren't, they weren't uh, you know, the, 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 these were sort of what I call beat officers, right? These are the guys just patrol officers. Uh, and yet they took on these terrorists who had, had these sophisticated weaponry. So we have, to, we have to recognize just how important they are to us. Because if we don't, if we allow the politically correct folks, if we allow uh, those who are willing to uh, sacrifice our lives for political correctness, if we allow them to be in control of our government, of our society, of our media, it literally will cost us our lives. And I saw a headline that said, you know, political correctness is killing us. Yep. And that is absolutely true. And so on the one hand, I'm impressed again with the, with the courage of our officers. And then I see this headline, and I know many of you saw it as well, from one of the, the New York, was it the New York Post, that said, God will not help us. Or was it, God will not solve this problem. Well, God will not fix it, that was it. It was the news, the Post is okay. The, the post is okay. It's the New York News. God will not fix it. Well, 
You know, first of all, God could fix it. Now, this, this is the strange thing. The power of prayer, we know, and many of us know in our individual lives, I know in my life, Janet, in her testimony, gave, gave great stories about, about how God had intervened in her life. God could fix it. But God chooses you know, what he chooses. And we, our role is not to uh, tell God what to do, but simply to be obedient. And let, and let him decide. Uh, and, and, but when I see a newspaper actually mocking prayer, actually mocking faith, you know, we've, we've gone now from them tolerating us as people of faith to them now actually attacking us. Because, you see, we're the problem. You know, the, you know, the accusation was somehow we're willing to pray, but we're not willing to do anything. Of course, the thing they want to do is take away all of our guns so we're all innocent, we're all victims now, and we're, we, we can't defend ourselves. So, this, this strange reality that we're living in in today's world, where we minimize the importance of the police and their courage on the one hand, and we minimize the importance of faith in God on the other, um, it, it makes me very frightened for my children that that dream that Jana talked about where a woman who's defending her kids is, is really hits home with me. I have nine grandchildren. That's the only reason I ever got into politics because I'm worried about the future of our country. Uh, and we simply have to stand up and be counted. Amen. And um, where is Pat, I think it is, that's running against John Eklund. You know, this, the idea that she would take on a sitting state senator takes tremendous courage. Uh, and not all of us can do that. But all of us can do something. All of us can be in prayer. In fact, you go to manage.com, you can join my prayer team. Uh, you can contribute to campaigns. You can walk door to door. You can uh, stuff literature in tubes. You can do all of those things. And frankly, you must do all of those things if we're going to have any chance of changing uh, the future of our country and the direction that we seem to be on in a very, very downward spiral. So, uh, I, I'm going to pass these out before I leave, but I wanted to talk about a couple of, of uh, specific things um, that happened just this week uh, in Congress and the impact that it's going to have upon you. And, you know, one of the, my frustrations when I was in the State House was the absolute manipulation uh, of the people by the political, the political leaders. And on both sides of that, were Democrats and Republicans. I would go to the private caucus meetings. These are the secret meetings. They used to call them the smoke-filled room meetings, but nobody's not smoke anymore. But still, they have these secret meetings. And they would say, well, this is what we're going to do publicly. This is what we're going to vote for. This is the policy we're going to put in place. But this is, this is what we're going to tell people we're doing. And it was always the spin. It was always about how you package uh, whatever it is you want to accomplish so that people either really won't understand what you're doing or will accept it even though it's something very different. And this week, there were two bills passed uh, in Congress that really fall into that kind of category. And it, and it really, it's so frustrating to me. And so you need to understand. So this week, the uh, Congress passed the education bill. Now, first thing you have to understand about, about the education bill uh, and also the, the, the transportation bill, both of them were passed this week, that together, the, those are, they were almost 2,500 pages. 2,500 pages. And they had three days to read it. So how many congressmen do you think read it? None. Virtually no one. Virtually no one. So what did these bills do? Well, the, the, the education bill expanded, not limited, but expanded the budget and authority of the, of the Federal Department of Education. In fact, they are now spending tens of millions of dollars in programs to reach not just your, your children in grade school, but in pre-kindergarten school. They've started a whole new outreach to pre-K to make sure that the federal government and its policies of ed on education, standards on education, are going to be started at the very earliest levels. And, you know, you might think to yourself, well, uh, gee, isn't it a good thing to have good education? Of course it is. Shouldn't we try to educate even kids in pre-K? Absolutely. Should the federal government bureaucrats be making that decision? No. No. Parents, local school boards. And the idea that we would have let the Federal Department of Education 
with, with its uh, approaching hundred billion dollar budget uh, be used as a cram down of federal policy, including of course Common Core, and I don't won't want you the whole explanation if you don't know about Common Core, but it's a federally sponsored standard of education uh, which is being uh, pushed uh, all across the country, including the state of Ohio. So it, we, we needed, frankly, to get rid of the Federal Department of Education. The Federal Department of Education did not exist prior to Jimmy Carter in the 1970s. And we, we seem to have managed to educate an awful lot of kids before the Federal Department of Education. Now, the Federal Department of Education is calling the tune for schools all across the country. Now, you could argue, and by the way, the Federal Department of Education has 5,000 employees. 5,000. And they don't educate one child. If we need the money from the federal government, which is debatable, but assuming you think we need the money from the Federal Department of Education, you could block grant that money to the states and let the states and the local school boards and the parents decide how to spend that money in education rather than the bureaucrats in Washington, D.C. Uh, and, and that's how it should be done, and that's the only way it should be done. And it's been talked about for decades that we should be doing that. And you can be sure that when I get to Washington, you see one of the first things we're going to be doing, I'll be doing, is filing a bill to get rid of the Federal Department of Education. We just need one person there to write the check and send the money to the state. So, uh, so that was one thing, the, the, the education bill. And then we had the, what some call the highway bill or the transportation bill passed uh, this week as well. So, you know, I was a, I was a Baker Township trustee just down the road in uh, Jogger County. And uh, it was always interesting to me when we wanted to do anything with our roads because roads were one of the most expensive things that the local township had to deal with. But there was always the money, right? Well, you can get the money uh, through the state or through the county. It's federally funded as long as you do it their way. Their way meaning the federal government's way. Uh, a couple of years ago, there was a beautiful street in, in Jogger County uh, called Hemlock Lane. Why do you think it was called Hemlock Lane? And all those beautiful hemlock trees out there. And all the neighbors loved it. Until the county came in and cut them all down because federal regulations said that road had to be so many feet wider. They had to get rid of those trees. So there's some bureaucrat in Washington literally telling the folks on Hemlock, Hemlock Lane, actually, it's called, that they can't have their trees if they want to have the federal government's money. And, and this is a, a, a problem that we've accepted on so many levels with, the, with, the, uh, with Washington, D.C., and what they do with our money. You know, people say, well, we're losing our liberty. We're losing our liberty. Folks, we're selling our liberty. Amen. In exchange for a federal check. And we have to decide we're not going to do that anymore. And we have to have people in Washington that are not willing to go along with that system. Amen. So the, the, the Department of Transportation is supposed to be funded by your uh, gasoline tax dollars. You know, you go get the gasoline, there's the tax right there. Gasoline would be a lot cheaper if you didn't have to pay the tax. But, well, we want the tax because we're going to fund, fund roads. Well, okay, so here's the first thing to think about with the, with the uh, transportation bill. The money that is gone, goes to the states isn't just for your roads. Well, it's for bike paths, actually. Bike paths. And you know those beautiful walls they put along the freeway? Beautification. That's part of, that's, you know, sound deadening and, and stuff like that. Now, listen, if you want to have your taxes raised to put up a sound barrier on, on 271, God bless you. Let your local government decide to do that and tax you for it. But don't have the federal government decide that's going to be done. And by the way, you notice how they're all falling apart now? A million dollars a mile to replace them. Yeah. So, a lot, so if, the, if the, there's 30% of the highway, quote, trust fund money, so that's when they take the money out of your gas, you pay it out of the gas tax, it goes into the trust fund, which is, when, when, listen, when a congressman tells you, oh, that money goes into a trust fund, that's a joke. It's a joke. Because there's no money, it's just I have But that's what they, so it's, it's a distrust fund, exactly right. Because you can't trust anybody there. So, so, they, so, but thirty percent of that money's going for non-road expenses. Now, now that money again, and, and uh, this has been, there's actually a bill in the, in the U.S. Senate right now 
to stop this nonsense and just block grant the money to the states, much like I just said about education. If they gave that money to the state of Ohio, the state of Ohio may or may not want to spend 30% of the implication. But you know, if there's holes in the roads, that's probably a higher priority than putting up that soundproofing on the walls. But let your local representatives make that decision, and not some bureaucrats in Washington, D.C. So 30% goes to that. Now, here's another it's a very sensitive subject, but here's another thing. When the federal government sends out the money for uh, building the roads, it requires that they hire companies to do the roads that pay what's called prevailing wage. Probably may have heard that phrase. It essentially means must pay union wage. That pays that adds about 25% to the cost. About 25% of the cost. When I was a Bainbridge Township trustee, the, uh, the the law required that if we had any kind of a construction project, and it was over at that time $25,000. It's higher now. These people are twenty-five thousand. You had to pay prevailing wage. So we would make sure that if we had a hundred thousand dollar building project, we broke it up into four or five different pieces. Because we knew that if we had to pay prevailing wage, the cost went up dramatically. So think about this now. The, the nearly bankrupt transportation trust fund, which they just uh, passed a bill adding, and I, I'm going to, uh, this number's going to skip you for the moment, I think it's 200 and some billion dollars to that trust fund, which they stole from other places. 50% of that cost is due directly to non-road expense, beautification, and requiring prevailing wage for all the jobs. Now again, if your local representatives are going to insist on paying prevailing wage or insist on beautification, that's up to them. But we should not allow these issues to be dictated uh, to our local representatives by Washington. And, uh, and on that point, I'll leave you with this. When I was in the legislature, we fought very hard against Medicaid expansion. Medicaid expansion was the, was the foundation, really, of Obamacare uh, in the state of Ohio. And there are a lot of reasons to fight against it. But one of the reasons why was because the added federal dollars coming to the state of Ohio, which is about $13 billion, would bring the state of Ohio budget to a place where 50% of all the revenue coming to the state of Ohio was coming from Washington, D.C. 50% of everything we wanted to spend would be spent according to the dictates of the Washington, not, not even the Congress, but, but the bureaucracy and the bureaucrats. I've said this many times, you may have heard me say this, when half of your revenue is coming from Washington, D.C., you are no longer a sovereign state. You are merely a department of the federal government. And you cannot function in that environment and expect you to get away with anything. So, so if the president decides he wants to send refugees to Ohio, if the president decides that, that, that he wants to do this or that in your state, you really don't have a choice when half of the money is coming from Washington. And we have just... We've just got to change that. And that's going to frankly take some pain because there will be many who say, well, we have to have the money. That's what John Kasich said about uh, Medicaid expansion. We've got to have those billions and billions of dollars. Okay, I'm going to say this. I'm thinking to myself, do I really want to say what I'm about to say? But you take a look at the billions of dollars. Medicaid expansion, $13 billion. Did any of that money get paid to poor people that are sick and need money? No. Who does it get paid to? It gets paid to Social Clinic, University Hospital, Ambusha, all those big statewide medical providers. And where does that money go? Well, it goes into salaries and overhead, often into the, directly into the, into the pockets and, and paychecks of, of executives and doctors at these hospitals. And what do they do? They write checks to politicians who make sure this goes through. And if you doubt that, you look up John Kasich's uh, uh, campaign finance reports as to who's funding his campaign, and it'll give you a straight line right back to what I call the medical industrial complex. Uh, you know, Eisenhower warned about the military industrial complex. There is a huge medical industrial complex. It's not just the insurance company but the hospitals themselves that are sucking money out of the federal and state governments. And believe me, that impacts on the politics 
uh, of those folks running for office when they turn around and support them. So it's something, uh, something we, just, we just have to change. So finally, I, um, the other side of the sheet that I'm all hanging out to, or hand out to, this is a couple of articles that, that um, I just printed out today. But this last one has to do with this, this business of these uh, Syrian refugees that are, that are being brought into our country. And uh, this article makes the point, and I, I hadn't realized this, but in the last five years, 680,000 immigrants uh, have come to the United States from predominantly Muslim countries. 680,000. Now you know we're talking about bringing Syrian refugees in by the tens of thousands, and and, and we just had this, uh, this this female terrorist who who was uh, brought in, and wasn't on anybody's watch list, and we know the tragedy that unfolded from that. Uh, two weeks ago, maybe it's three weeks ago now, the Congress, in response to the Paris attacks, passed what they called the Safe Act. The Safe Act was supposed to create a pause. You may have even heard this in the headlines. It's a pause in the Syrian refugee program. Well, that's simply a lie. It's not a pause. It's not a pause because all the SAFE Act requires is that President Obama's appointees of Homeland Security and FBI and that they that they sign a paper saying those Syrians can come in. That there's that they're safe to come in. Well, we saw what happened when, when the federal government allowed this, this woman, this Pakistani woman who, who, uh, who, who was engaged and I guess got married. She went through a vetting process, but, but when you have thousands, tens of thousands of people dedicating themselves to the ISIS cause who are not necessarily uh, on somebody's watch list because they haven't yet committed a crime, there is no way to vet them. There's just no way to do it. It doesn't matter how many signatures you get on a piece of paper. Additional paperwork is not going to keep our families safe from this kind of attack. So we, we, we have to sort of get over this idea that we get accused of being mean and nasty because we don't want to help people. We should help these people. We should help these people in two ways. We should help these people by creating safe zones in Syria and the Middle East where they can stay in their own homeland and then we should help these people by bombing the heck out of them. And I can use stronger language when Pastor would yell at me. Bombing the heck out of ISIS right now. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's right. <laughs> you know, when they interview these, uh, these military folks about what we're doing, you know, they, because the Obama people say, well, you know, we had so many, so many sorties that they sent out the planes and, and they, to attack ISIS. Well, of course, the number of sorties they're having is minuscule compared to what we did a few years ago in the first Iraq war. But beyond that, they come back with their bombs because they're told they can't drop them. Oh, maybe, maybe some civilians will be killed. Listen, I don't want to kill any civilians. But I'm first and foremost concerned about the safety of the American people. Amen. And until we get that straight, until the people in Washington understand that they take an oath to uphold our Constitution, to protect our borders, to defend our nation, until they understand that first and foremost, don't talk to me about the other nations. You know, I was talking to my wife the other night. I said, honey, how many people do you think died when they dropped the bombs on Japan? On Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I mean, it's a horrible thing to think about. But many civilians died. And, I, and, and I'm, I'm sad that that happened. But I don't want many Americans to die instead. And that was, the, that was the calculation that was made during World War II. And we have to decide what we're willing to do to defend ourselves. Uh, there was a study released just recently that there are at least 83 mosques in the United States that are, are considered to be radicalized mosques. That is, they are preaching radical uh, Muslim jihadism. Now, I don't know why there's an FBI agent in every one of those mosques. And maybe there is. I mean, you know, the FBI said there's all kinds of investigations about that. But until we understand that the danger is here, and uh, many of you have probably heard of the Muslim Brotherhood. You know, Senator Cruz has been trying to get the Muslim Brotherhood uh, identified and, and labeled as a terrorist group because they are an extension of many of these terrorist groups, Hamas, 
uh, and others in the Mideast, they're, they're, they're the political extension of that group. They are in this country. They have supported and funded many of these mosques. Now, we're training our military. How, how, how bad is that? Well, it's pretty bad. If, if we have young men and women now, who as a result of their exposure in these mosques, are turning guns upon American citizens. So, as difficult as it is, you know, I, I, as Janet mentioned, you know, I was one of the sponsors of the heartbeat bill when I was in the house. I'm a very pro-life guy. You know, so when I sit here and talk about, gee, you know, uh, we need to be more aggressive in our defense and our attack on ISIS, I don't mean to suggest that we shouldn't take human life uh, see human life is important because, of course, it is important. I believe it's important from the wound to the tomb. But God does not expect you to be a victim. God does not expect you to be silent when they turn the guns on your children. And I, for one, am not willing to sit by and see American <coughs> citizens slaughtered in the name of political correctness that our president and others are determined to defend. And when I get to Washington, D.C., if nothing else, you will have a strong voice to defend American citizens first. So, uh, with that, I'm going to shut up uh, and be happy to take a couple questions if anyone. Uh, yeah, now, ISIS claims they have 8,000 jihadists mixed in with these so called refugees. Yeah. Plus, the fact this woman who was vetted, who was out there in San Bernardino, was much more thoroughly vetted than any of these so-called refugees could ever be because there's no records in Syria to back right. their claims of who they are. Right. Well, there have been reports, there was one report I read that months or so ago, uh, of, a, of a truck that was uh, discovered or, or, or by, by someone from Syria. Uh, anyway, it's full of, of uh, passports. You know, the Syrian government has essentially fallen apart. So it doesn't take anything. It's not even a phony passport. It's a, these are real passports. So. There's no way to vet these people. And we should not accept... Look, the federal government can't do much right. You know, if you like to run the way they run the VA, or the way they set up websites or run Obamacare, you know, I mean, how well are they going to be able to vet these people? Even, even if the information was available, I wouldn't be confident they could do it well. But we know, as you point out, the information is not even available. Any other questions? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm, I'm being told to make the point, you know, that their response is that we they want to take away our guns. You know, this this idea that the, the way to stop a terrorist. You know, you read, you read the stories. I'm sure they were getting packages in their home. There were men coming and going from. They were working out in the garage. And the neighbors didn't want to say anything because they didn't want to be seen as, as racist or bigoted. Uh, listen, I don't want to be seen as racist and bigoted either, but I also don't want to be dead. And more importantly, I don't want my neighbors and my children dead. And by golly, uh, we need to hold on to our guns to defend ourselves in those situations. And frankly, we need to hold on to defend ourselves against the government that decides that we're actually the enemy. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I was just going to say, um, <clears throat> Claire Lopez has been saying this for so long about the uh, infiltration of the Muslim in things like care and that, and I, you probably saw this, that within, that they withheld Syed Farouk's name until they could contact somebody from care. And then Care could get up there and um, yeah, they brought the brother in, brother line. Yeah. yeah, brought the brother in law in and talked about it. So this is in, this is weaved into our government, and I, I don't know how we're going to get away from it. Well, you know, in a lot of these issues, um, of course, you need people first of all to be willing to be vocal about it. One of the great problems, frankly, I have with my opponent, uh, Dave Joyce, as your current congressman, is, is he doesn't say anything. No. You never hear from him. In fact, did you get a robocall from me yesterday? I got, a I, got a, I got a robocall from him yesterday wanting me to take a survey so he would know 
what is important to me as a voter. Now let me tell you something, folks. You know what I know? I know from the news that it's important to me to secure this country and to keep these refugees out of, out of the United States. I know from, from, my, from my wife that it's important that our friends who are losing their jobs because of the economy